Greetings, and welcome to this latest teleconference by MS Focus. I'm your host, Chris Payne, for MS Focus, and I'm joined by Dr. John Schaefer, who will present Why Me? What We Know About the Causes of MS, Including Genetics. After the presentation from Dr. Schaefer, we'll open it up for your questions and comments. Now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker. Dr. John Schaefer is founder and emeritus director of the Mercy Multiple Sclerosis Center and medical director of the MS Achievement Center in Carmichael, California. He practiced with Mercy Medical Group in Sacramento prior to his retirement in February, 2021 after 45 years in practice. He is currently on the faculty and emeritus board of directors of Can Do MS. He is a member of the Consortium of Multiple Sclerosis Centers and regularly attends major MS medical meetings and speaks at patient and physician MS programs. We're pleased to have him join us uh, to present on this important topic. Dr. Schaefer, thank you for being with us and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, I've, I've had the pleasure of being part of uh, several uh, MS focus presentations over a, a number of years now. And what we'll talk about today, I, I think, you know, when any of us has a medical problem or something comes up, the first thing you want to know is why did this happen? Why, why me? You know, your body's supposed to work perfectly. And so when something goes wrong, there's got to be uh, an explanation. And I think with, with multiple sclerosis in particular, you know, through the years, I've, uh, I've heard from lots and lots of people about, uh, uh, you know, why they think that they have MS. So some common uh, ideas are, uh, some people tell me that they think it was, you know, stress, you know, that ugly divorce or the, that horrible boss who fired them for unjustly and uh, or physical trauma that an accident that they had when they were a kid or whatever i caught it from somebody you know i worked with somebody who had ms maybe i caught it from them or i inherited it from someone in my family you know i think we can in the uh, chat session uh does anyone have in which i'm actually not seeing right now but does anybody have any uh uh, ideas uh, about that. Uh, uh, maybe let's hear from a few people, but how many think that that it was an emotional trauma that uh, that caused your MS? So there's uh, one raised hand. Okay. Uh, how about physical trauma, an accident? uh that caused uh, the the ms any hands raised there or i caught it from somebody or let's see hands of those who uh have someone else in the family who has ms And I'll bet there's a lot of other hands out there that are still figuring out how to get raised, uh, but let's, uh, let's continue on from here. So what about each of these? Stress, emotional trauma. You know, <clears throat> there's been a lot of studies and surveys uh, through the years, and what we can say is emotional trauma is not likely to be the cause of MS or even the cause of a true exacerbation in multiple sclerosis. Stress has an enormous amount to do with uh, living with multiple sclerosis because if there is impairment or if there are symptoms of MS, unquestionably they can be much worse when, uh, when there's stress or when there are uh, traumatic uh, uh, uh things going on in one's life so yes stress 
definitely plays a role in uh, the, the behavior of MS, but it's probably not the cause in the first place of the MS. Similarly, with physical trauma, uh, there have been a lot of surveys and studies. You know, through the years, I've had a few people who, you know, a car accident that, uh, that affected their mobility and then their, their walking didn't get back to normal uh, as completely or as soon as expected. And then it's realized that they have multiple sclerosis. But uh, those are few enough that uh, it was probably uh, a uh, coincidental thing. I caught it from somebody. MS is not contagious, so you don't catch it from somebody. And I think this is always an issue of, you know, if there's someone in the close family or in the household who has MS or is a person uh, in that, another person in the household going to be affected by it. I inherited it from someone in my family. Well, there, we do, we will talk about this more. Uh, unquestionably, genetics does have a role in who gets multiple sclerosis. There's not likely to be a single cause of multiple sclerosis, but what we know and what we, the, the party line is that uh, there's an interaction between genetic aspects and environmental factors. And we'll talk about these in more detail. Uh, so we don't know the cause of MS, but we know a lot about who gets MS. That if we take a whole bunch of people with MS, what's different about them and their backgrounds than people without MS? It's estimated that about a million people in the United States have MS. Women are two to four times more likely than men to have MS. So there you have it right there that, uh, uh, that uh, being a woman is a risk for having MS. The most common age of onset of first symptoms is 29 years. So in general, MS begins in young adults. Now, kids can have MS. Uh, it's much less common. And in fact, there's some recent studies that show that people, that kids uh, who were thought to have MS actually uh, have, have other conditions that, uh, that could look like MS. Everybody says, you know, I'm 50 years old when I got my first symptoms or even older than that. Uh, and so it didn't begin when I was a young adult, but when a 51 year old with the first attack of MS comes into the office and we do an MRI brain scan, we look at this scan and say, you know, this is not new. This has been there for a while. We know that one can have MS and not have symptoms from it. And so that person may have had it for a long time and just uh, uh, not had their symptoms yet. Interestingly, there is a, a whole study now of people who had MRI brain scans for other reasons, you know, a headache or a head bump or something, and, uh, and it shows things that look like multiple sclerosis, but they've never had any symptoms or physical findings of multiple sclerosis. And so uh, we know that people can have MS and not know it. Let's talk about just a, a quick review of what is multiple sclerosis. In the upper right hand uh, corner here, I hope you can see my, my arrow. Uh, this is a, a model of, this is a nerve fiber and nerve fibers are what carry signals back and forth between the brain and the tip of your toes and every part of your body in between. And these nerve fibers are wrapped with a coating, an insulation that's myelin. And, uh, and that myelin is important for uh, making sure that these nerve signals can travel at high speed along these uh, uh, pathways. In multiple sclerosis, there's damage to the myelin. 
And uh, as you can see in this picture, the myelin is fragmented uh, or removed completely. And when the myelin isn't there, that nerve fiber either can't co conduct its impulse uh, uh, rapidly enough or, uh, or it may not be able to conduct it at all. And so when you consider that, that there's you know, millions and millions of these nerve fibers that are present in any nerve pathway in the spinal cord or in the brain that you know what percentage of them are working and what percentage of them are not determines how severe the symptoms are and location and the left hand side here's the brain and the spinal cord which are where ms affects us and also in the optic nerves and here is a lesion, so a spot. This is an area in the spinal cord where the, uh, the myelin has been damaged, and the result is this numbness and tingling and pain in the, uh, in the legs and maybe difficulty walking. I've always liked this picture. Uh, again, I hope you can see my arrow, but in the center of this, uh, this circle is the nerve fiber, just like we saw in the previous thing. And this jelly roll material around the outside is the myelin. Now, the MS is, is uh, coming from problems in the brain and the spinal cord. But what we know is causing those problems are uh, misbehavior of the immune system of the body. So multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disorder. There are a number of autoimmune disorders in which the immune system attacks uh, other organs. Uh, for instance, in lupus, uh, that can attack uh, many organs, including the kidneys, or uh, rheumatoid arthritis that attacks the joints, uh, or Sjogren's syndrome, or others that, uh, that have similar mechanisms but affect different parts of the body. This is a kind of a scheme that tells us overall what's happening in multiple sclerosis. Over here on the left-hand side is a blood vessel. And in that blood vessel is a T cell. This is a T lymphocyte. What does the immune system do? The immune system protects one from things that don't belong there. Usually we're talking about viruses or bacteria. It can be cancer cells or dead cells or, or normal cells that have gone awry. So uh, T cells look for and remove uh, stuff that doesn't belong there. On the top is a, a T cell, which is called a naive T cell. So it's naive in the sense that it does not have any instructions. It's not looking for anything in particular, but in the bloodstream, it becomes activated. It gets an instruction uh, to look for something in particular. I like to think of this as the T cells are the police cruisers and that are uh, circulating around in your city. So a, a police car and a policeman, uh, they're, they're looking for trouble. And to begin with, they don't have anything in particular that they've, they're looking for, but just uh, surveying the situation. But then the dispatcher sends out a message, says uh, there was just a bank robbery at 5th and Main Street and uh, a five foot five blonde woman with a bag over her shoulder jumped into a black SUV and sped away. So this lymphocyte now, or this police car has been activated to go and look for that particular uh, blonde woman in a, in a black SUV. These lymphocytes then, when they're activated, get into the brain. And this is the blood-brain barrier, and they cross through the cells that, uh, that line the blood vessel and get into the brain and the spinal cord itself. And in the brain and the spinal cord, they uh, react with a lot of other uh, molecules called cytokines and other kinds of cells, and they look for uh, 
something, uh, and and that's what causes the the myelin injury. So it's as if uh, if you're a, a blonde woman and you're driving a black SUV, you may be in trouble because uh, there's this uh, lymphocyte that's out looking for you and may mistakenly identify you as uh, the person that robbed the bank. And we think that that's probably what's happening in multiple sclerosis, that there's something about the myelin that is mistaken for something else that the uh, cell was activated against. This is a very quick overview. And uh, there's many, many, many layers to this. And, and to just go down one step lower, uh, here are different kinds of lymphocytes. So here is that naive T cell. This is the one that we said is, you know, gotten no instructions at all and it uh, doesn't know what to do. Uh, and then below this dotted line uh, are the cells that are activated. So these are various chemicals and that are involved in the process of activating these lymphocytes. There are numerous different kinds of lymphocytes that are effector cells. These now cause inflammation and demyelination. They have been converted to cells that cause damage. But in this uh, romantic uh, story here, there's some good guys. And there are also uh, T cells that are called regulatory cells. And these are cells that restrain the, uh, the lymphocytes from causing problems, saying, you know, maybe, maybe you don't want to touch that myelin. It's, it's uh, valuable, so don't damage it. So we've got these two types. We've got effector T cells that cause inflammation and demyelination, and we've got regular, regulatory cells that, uh, that restrain them and, and try to uh, reform them and correct them. In a healthy individual, the regulatory immune cells and the effector immune cells are pretty well balanced. They, they face off against each other and work together. In autoimmune diseases in general, the problem is that the regulatory cells don't work right and are overpowered by the effector immune cells. And that's pretty much true across the board for multiple sclerosis and lupus and uh, rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune disorders. So what is the cause of MS? And, and here's a list of things that we'll talk about today. Um, these are the most uh, well-established and there are numerous others. We'll talk about genetic factors. We've already referred to gender and age, uh, geography and season month of birth, uh, vitamin D levels, virus infections, and smoking. These are the things that are, are most uh, commonly associated with who gets multiple sclerosis. Let's talk about genetics. In this diagram, for a person walking down the street, let's say a 30-year-old person has nobody else in the family uh, with MS, uh, there's about one in a thousand chances that that person will ever develop multiple sclerosis. If their person has somebody else in the family, a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, particularly a first degree relative, now the chance goes from one in a thousand to like three or four out of a hundred which is you know, considerably greater than one out of a thousand, but it's still limited, three or four percent chance that that person will in their lifetime develop multiple sclerosis. A non-identical twin has about the same chance, the 5%. Interestingly, an identical twin 
of that person who has just developed MS has a 31% chance or 30 to 40% chance of developing multiple sclerosis in their lifetime. So clearly there's something about the genetics because the identical twins of course have exactly the same DNA. So something about that DNA that determined that the, the second twin will develop multiple sclerosis. But it also tells us that what about the other 69, 70% of identical twins who don't develop multiple sclerosis? So clearly there's, uh, there's gotta be other uh, uh, reasons why a person gets multiple sclerosis. And that's why we said that it's an interaction between genetic and uh, environmental things. There are actually several hundred genes that have been identified as being more common in people with MS, but the biggest uh, one is the HLA-DRB1-1501 gene, and uh, 80 million people in the world have this, but most don't have multiple sclerosis. But if you take people with multiple sclerosis, you find that half the people with MS have that gene, which is far greater proportion than in the general population. It's also interesting, this is not immediately related, but that uh, in passing from parents to kids, mothers uh, having daughters with MS is a lot more common than fathers having sons with multiple sclerosis. Gender. As we've already said, women are two to four times more likely than men to have MS. In children, it's equal. Boys and girls, uh, you know, have an equal uh, incidence of multiple sclerosis. And that difference between boys and girls appears in puberty. So really suggesting that something hormonal is going on and other things that tell us that hormones are important in MS is that in pregnancy and people with MS, uh, they're much less likely to have an attack or MS activity during pregnancy, but yet the, uh, the risk may increase uh, after the pregnancy is over. And, uh, and there's been some studies that the more pregnancies a woman has, the less likely she is to develop MS. So what is it? You know, do female hormones somehow aggravate MS? There's also theories that maybe male hormones are protective against MS, and that's why men are less likely to get it. Geography. We've known for years and years that, that MS uh, is, is, is different, uh, occurs differently in different parts of the world, and it's related to how far you are from the equator. So here is the equator, zero degrees, and the brown and tan areas are where multiple sclerosis is not very common. The red is where MS is most common. And here the Scandinavian countries uh, are, are really the hotbed of multiple sclerosis along with Canada and the northern half of the United States. The purple is that it's presumed high risk, but the statistics are not really in uh, there. And so you, you can't say for sure. Now, even in the United States, the risk of developing MS is different in the northern half from the southern half. This all relates to where a person grew up, where you spent the first roughly 15 years of life. So people who lived in, in uh, and who grew up in Florida uh, are much less likely to ever develop MS than people who grew up in Minnesota and Wisconsin and Michigan and the Dakotas or in Canada. Now, there was theories that when I was in medical school, which is a long, long, long time ago, there was a, a theory that maybe it was pine trees, that there's more pine trees in Wisconsin than there are in Florida. And so maybe that's it. But what we realized 
uh, after a while was that vitamin D is probably the explanation. If you take a whole bunch of people who have, are presenting with multiple sclerosis, their blood vitamin D level is uh, much like more likely to be abnormally low than in the general population. And where do you get vitamin D? It's from sunlight. And so it may be that in those uh, areas of the world, uh, if we go back in that slide, that the closer you are to the equator, the more time you spend in sunlight compared to uh, the northern uh, part of the United States or Canada or the Scandinavian countries where less of the year and and uh, and shorter hours and things uh, uh, that uh, you're not getting the same exposure. Interestingly, it's been shown that babies born to mothers with the, the mother with a low vitamin D level, that that baby is at higher risk of developing MS during its lifetime. It's also been shown that people who have low vitamin D levels at the beginning of MS may uh, have an earlier conversion to from relapsing remitting forms of MS to a secondary progressive MS, the progressive kind of MS coming later in life. And, uh, and also uh, higher levels of vitamin D in the bloodstream uh, were associated with, with less uh, MRI indication of, of damage and uh, higher levels of vitamin D may have better response uh, to uh, some of the MS treatments. So it's clear that vitamin D induces T cells with immunosuppressive properties. So going back to what we saw, that chain of different kinds of T cells, that uh, uh, vitamin D may be a factor that uh, determines how bad a T cell is going to be once it gets uh, developed. Age. Just show you this rather quickly that you can see that the, the peak of MS is in, in people 30 to 39 years of age. That's the highest uh, uh, number per 100,000 who develop new symptoms. Uh, it may occur in kids. It may show up in, in, uh, in later life. And we talked about that a few minutes ago. Infections. This is very interesting, and, and, and I'm sure that many of you have read in the press and in the MS uh, feeds uh, just in the, in the last couple of months, new information about this. We've known for years that, uh, that infections in childhood may be a trigger for developing MS. And we've known for a long time that exposure to Epstein-Barr virus uh, is a requirement for developing MS. Now, Epstein-Barr virus is mononucleosis. And it's been shown that, uh, uh, that in people with, with MS, uh, everybody has been exposed to uh, the Epstein-Barr virus, that, that it's a requirement. You can't develop MS if you haven't been exposed to that. And so the belief is that those Epstein-Barr virus infected cells turn some kind of a switch that increases the risk of autoimmune disorders. Now, I, as I said before, you know, we've known this for you know, 10, 15 years, but a recent study in January of this year strengthened that evidence that the Epstein-Barr virus uh, is, is important. And what they did is they looked at military personnel. Now, when people are, are in the, uh, the military, uh, uh, they, they have frequent blood tests through the course of the military, uh, looking for things like AIDS or other diseases. And so in the Department of Defense are these millions of millions of samples of, of blood from people. Uh, in the service. So what they did is they took 
uh, 955 uh, military service personnel who developed MS while they were in the military or shortly after their period of service. And they went back and they looked at the blood samples that had been drawn uh, periodically to see when did they uh, show up with their Epstein-Barr virus uh, uh, serology. And uh, Epstein-Barr virus affects about 95% of the population. Uh, but again, 100% uh, of people with MS have the Epstein-Barr virus. And what they found uh, in this military study is that there was a correlation that uh, that people who developed MS, that it was in some time frame near the time that they converted uh, from uh, negative to, to positive Epstein-Barr virus. So again, just proving that not only do you have to be uh, positive to Epstein-Barr virus, but that there is some time period after one becomes positive that the uh, uh, the symptoms are of MS appear. Uh, it's also been shown that the later onset and more severe mononucleosis have a higher risk of developing MS. So younger kids who have uh, uh, mono that they may not even know they have, you know, have less chance of developing MS than people who develop in their, in their teen years and, uh, and have more severe infections that require, for example, hospitalization. It's also been shown that Epstein-Barr virus, which can occur, Epstein-Barr virus is lifelong, that the virus gets into the lymphocytes and remains in the lymphocytes through the entire life of the person who's been infected by the Epstein-Barr virus. But the Epstein-Barr virus can escape from these cells from time to time in exacerbations, uh, the, you know, much like MS, and maybe even associated with uh, exacerbations of MS symptoms. Now, this last part is really interesting. And, uh, and this is just uh, some recent papers of, uh, of Joe Berman who, uh, or Joe Berger who uh, pointed out that, that a number of the medications that we use to treat multiple sclerosis, particularly those that, uh, that inhibit B cells, uh, things like rituxan and, uh, and ocrelizumab and, uh, and, and a few others, that these are also effective in uh, in treating uh, 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 Epstein-Barr virus infections, and uh, that may explain why these drugs are uh, helpful in multiple sclerosis. That they may be helping multiple sclerosis because they're suppressing these Epstein-Barr virus uh, activity. Smoking, another risk factor. Uh, uh, it's been looked at as to you know what what is the effect of age and and how long a person has smoked and whether they stop smoking. Age doesn't matter. At any age, uh, people who have been smokers uh, are more likely to develop uh, multiple sclerosis. The cumulative dose, yes, if, if a person has smoked for more than six years, particularly men, they are at increased risk for developing multiple sclerosis. Duration and intensity, for people that have smoked for less than five years, it, it depends on how much they smoked, were they heavier smokers or lighter smokers, but if it's more than five years that they've smoked, it doesn't matter that light smokers are just as likely to develop MS as heavier smokers if they've smoked for more than five years. Stopping. The risk of developing MS does go down after a person stops smoking, but it may be uh, 10 years before it gets back to uh, the normal risk. 
It's also been shown that that some of the uh, the genetic profiles uh, may be uh, interacting with smoking. That smoking is is more likely to uh, cause MS in people with particular genetic uh, uh, makeups. So the conclusion: stop smoking or don't smoke. What about uh, you know children of people with MS who already have a high risk, be higher risk because they uh, they have somebody in the family that they in particular shouldn't uh, shouldn't smoke. There's numerous other things that we know are related to uh, uh, developing multiple sclerosis. The gut microbiome. Probably everybody has heard about this. What we know is that in the intestines of your body, there are billions of, uh, of, of bacteria. Uh, in fact, uh, there's like five and a half pounds of, of bacteria in uh, a person's intestines. And we know that like 85, 90% of the immune system is located in the walls of the intestines. And the, uh, the bacteria that are there affect the kind of T cells that uh, are, uh, are being produced and the type of antibody production by those T cells. So uh, there's strong, strong suggestion that the bacteria in the, in the gut may uh, have to do with autoimmune disorders, at least have to do with uh, how a person's immune system behaves. Uh, in a study of twins, uh, identical twins, uh, there were 34 uh, pairs and uh, that that had uh, you know identical gut microbiome. The limitation of this, before we get too excited about it, is that no one has still shown that there is a type of bacteria or a collection, a selection of bacteria that's better for MS or uh, worse for MS, or that if we had some treatment for it, uh, that it would change the, the chance of getting MS or change the behavior of MS. So that's where we are talking about, you know, probiotics or other things, you know, changes of diet that that could affect uh, uh, a person's development of MS or the behavior of the MS that we just don't have enough information yet to know. So uh, I wouldn't go uh, overboard about that. So I think that that brings us to the end of the discussion of what are the risk factors. Now I'm really interested in hearing, you know, what are uh, are your questions or uh, or comments about this? Uh, and I think that that probably the way to get through this is through the the chat system. Uh, and here's one already. What about secondhand smoke? I don't know the answer to that, and I'm not sure that it is known uh, whether secondhand smoke increases uh, one's risk. On that note, I'd like to take a moment to clarify that we are now ready for questions. If you have a question or comment, you can use it. Uh, you can ask it using the Q&A button in the app which also allows you to send your question anonymously if you, so, if you so choose. Or you can ask your question live by raising your hand. To do so, click the raise hand button or press star nine if you're on the phone. I will call on you and then you'll be able to unmute uh, to ask a question. And also as has been observed, you can uh, present your question in the chat. And so here, see, go ahead. So, so here's another uh, question in chat. Are children of people with MS more likely to have blood cancers or other autoimmune disease? 
there is some weak association between autoimmune diseases in, in the family, uh, but uh, it's not very well defined. And I'm not aware of any relationship to, to blood cancers in other family members. We have a question from um, David. David, go ahead. Hello. Good day, Dr. Schaefer. Hi, David. Hi. Uh, I am from the Bahamas, and I have been diagnosed with MS from the age of 14 years old. I remember when the doctor, my GP, told me that I had MS, I, I went into the car and I cried and, I, and my mom was in the front seat and I said, why me? Why does this have to happen to me? She said, she said, why not you? What makes you think that you're better than anyone else? I was 14 years old in grade nine and that turned my whole life around and now this is 25 years later. What makes me think that I'm better than anyone else? So I'm encouraging everyone else. What makes you think that you're better than anyone else? This is just my comment to you, to this whole subject of why me? And, and we can still go out there and live our best life. And that is all I wanted to say. I think that's absolutely correct. And, uh, and you know, I've talked with other physicians, particularly cancer specialists who deal with, you know, people that are dying uh, from their diseases. And uh, when someone says, you know, why me? Uh, the answer may be, why not? You know, uh, uh, we're not protected. But I think also your point, David, that, that really, you know, living your best life with MS is, is what it's all about. And there are many resources now that are available, including MS Focus and, and, and other organizations that, that really help to, uh, uh, to understand the, the disorder and to, uh, to live one's best life. So here's yeah, one. Yes. I was going to say we have another question in chat from Rita from Facebook. Right. So I see that. I live in Massachusetts, and I and five people throughout life lived on the same street growing up, and we all have MS. There's no one in the family who have it to this day. I was diagnosed in my early 40s. My neurologist believe uh, I may have it in high school, but it was not shown until I was married and had children. I did grow up near a large Air Force base. I was not a smoker. Do we see pockets of MS? And the answer to that is yes, there have been some, uh, some famous uh, pockets of MS. Uh, the, uh, uh, one of the first was in the Faroe Islands. And this was like years ago. The Faroe Islands is a little group of islands between uh, Norway and Iceland. And in the Faroe Islands, they never had any MS. There were no reports of anybody having MS. And then there was an outbreak and a whole bunch of people developed MS. And uh, but then after a number of years, no new cases of MS showing up. And so figure, you know, why did that happen? And what they connected it with, uh, it possibly, no one knows for sure, was that the uh, British soldiers were stationed in the, the Faroe Islands during the war. And among their dogs, there was an outbreak of distemper virus. And so, there's the burning question of, you know, did the distemper virus in the dogs have anything to do with, and so that would be another thing you could add to that list of uh, what we said is that viruses and virus exposures actually early on in life may increase a, a risk of, uh, uh, of, of MS. Now, it's hard to know on your street in Massachusetts whether 
that would be an explanation. Uh, those things are always very confounding uh, that uh, uh, when you see groups like that, was it just about uh, uh, coincidence or was there really something uh, going around? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't be more precise about that. Then we have a question about smoking cigarettes versus smoking marijuana. And I think the issue with marijuana is always that, uh, you know, how much did one smoke? And, uh, uh, you know, most people who smoke marijuana don't smoke as heavily as, as, uh, as heavier cigarette smokers. So I don't know of any study that has uh, uh, drawn a connection between smoking marijuana and, uh, and developing multiple sclerosis. Another. Um, okay. Uh, what I wanted to say is, is that before we move on to our next question, I just want to remind uh, people that if you have a question or comment, you can use, you can ask you using the Q and A button in the app, um, which allows you to send your question anonymously if you want, or you can raise your, or you can ask your question live by raising your hand. To do so, click on the raise hand button or press star nine if you're on the phone. I will call on you and then you will be able to unmute your unmute to ask your question. So now on to our next question. So um, the question is, so I realized that the trauma of my husband's death did not cause my MS, but could it be that my symptoms just came to a head at that time so that a few months later I was diagnosed? And again, that's really a, a, a good question I, I think when you know when people are you know experiencing devastating loss like you know the death of a, a spouse which is is horrific that uh it does affect us uh physically and and you know th those physical effects may uh may get mixed up with with symptoms of, of ms uh and so uh, I think one would, would say that probably it was coincidental, but there may have been some interaction. I guess if, if you hadn't experienced that trauma, would you have still developed MS or, you know, at that time? And, and you know, I would say probably so, but uh, it might have been recognized in a, diff a different way. But again, these puzzling questions uh what exactly is it that makes smoking a risk is it toxins so again the smoking may increase the number of the bad lymphocytes and there have been studies that have, have shown this that find that the 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 uh the mix of the lymphocytes is different in smokers and it favors the uh, the lymphocytes that are more malignant and more likely to cause the damage. Uh, the uh, uh, is it toxins or a compromised immune system? I guess that that's part of the same uh, question, and I guess that's always a possibility too that uh, that if the uh, uh, pulmonary, if your respiratory status has been impaired, that it, you, you may be more sensitive or more recognized uh, when physical things uh, add to it. Uh, and then I did have the symptoms previously. Let's see, that was, uh, that was, uh, uh, came to a head. So, so th this was the same question as, uh, you know, my husband's death did not cause my MS, but could my symptoms have come to a head at that time? So a few months later I was diagnosed and then I did have symptoms previously. So absolutely. I mean, I think that, uh, that again, stress may 
interact with symptoms that are uh, that are already there, uh, and uh, uh, and so it may uh, light up uh, the uh, the symptoms. Uh, stress stress can increase the appreciation of symptoms. I'm going you to know, they, go ahead. I, I was just going to uh, connect here with a question and answer session. Section, yeah. Uh, okay, so here's here's some more questions. Is that what you were going to say? Uh, yes. Okay. Do my sons have to be concerned about their vitamin D levels since I, their mother, have MS? Uh, I guess the broad answer to that is yes. Uh, we don't normally go around doing vitamin D levels on, on people uh, who are, you know, in, in normal health or who do not have issues. I think one question that comes up is vitamin D supplements. And, you know, vitamin D supplements are inexpensive. Uh, the risk of uh, taking them is low. I know in Toronto, a number of years ago, Toronto Children's Hospital, they were doing a study in which they would give uh, vitamin D supplements to children of, uh, of uh, people with, with multiple sclerosis. Uh, I think that that's a horrible study to do because, you know, it, it requires years of follow-up and uh, to see, you know, whether people who have been taking the vitamin C, these uh, uh, supplements are less likely to, uh, to have, uh, to have it. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then you never know how many people are actually taking when you do a study, how many people who are in the control group are actually uh, taking vitamin D because it's so common and so inexpensive. Overall, my opinion and my advice on that is that it would be a good idea for them to take vitamin D supplements. Another thing is that, uh, you know, one could ask the, your, the physicians of your children. So for somebody who has MS, uh, you know, inform the primary physician of the child that uh, that they may be at risk and that uh, uh, their vitamin D level would be of interest. And, and uh, it's an easy test to do. Uh, it's just that, you know, insurance payments may not cover things uh, when, when the questions are so general. Can calcium supplements interact with, uh, uh, with, with MS drugs such as Tisabri? Uh, not that I know of, no. And then uh, uh, finally, uh, can having two blood transfusions in my head and being fed through my foot at five months old together with meningitis virus have something to do with developing MS. I don't know of anything about the blood transfusions uh, in, in the, when you were five months old that would make it more or less likely. Uh, again, a viral infection. I mean, we know that, uh, that there is some relationship to childhood virus infections and uh, developing multiple sclerosis. I see that we have another question in the chat. Uh, this one from Monica. I'm, uh, I'm looking for that. Uh, let's see. Okay, the, I found it, my chat box. And I had mono when I was 11. I know back then doctors didn't push uh, the whole take your meds uh, to completion. I do remember whenever I was sick, I would stop taking meds when I felt better, including when I had mono 
So if I had taken meds given to me for mono uh, to completion, would it have prevented the onset of my MS today? Well, that's a tough question. Uh, uh, I think that medications for mono, particularly in the 1980s, were probably not very effective. Uh, there are there are a few medications that are available nowadays that may be effective against mononucleosis, but I don't think they were available back then. And so I'm not sure what uh, medications your doctor was giving you for mono, but it was probably, you know, ordinary antibiotics and things. Uh, and so to the extent that they probably uh, weren't very effective, you you probably didn't do yourself any harm by uh, by stopping them early. So I hope that gives you some relief that uh, you can go through the rest of your life without that guilt feeling. Let me see here what, uh, okay, I don't see any other things in the chat. Here's another question and answer. Will there ever be a cure? Isn't that a great question? And hopefully, yes. Um, you know, going back to this recent uh, information about the Epstein-Barr virus, that with this study of military people in January, there were some people this, uh, who were uh, uh, bold enough to say, so Epstein-Barr virus is the cause of multiple sclerosis. But to prove that, the question would be, you know, we, we've already said that 95% of the people in the population have had Epstein-Barr virus. And so uh, why do, don't uh, more of those people have multiple sclerosis if it is the cause? The other thing is that to show that something is a cause, you have to and, and these are the rules of epidemiology, that you have to show that removing that cause takes away the disease. And so you would have to prove that if you did away with Epstein-Barr virus, that MS wouldn't occur anymore. And while it may be intuitive to think that, we don't know for sure. Now, the question came up, there was an article in the New York Times Sunday Magazine about a month or so ago that says, what is that new information from this military study of Epstein-Barr virus? Where does it get us? I mean, how has it helped us? And uh, one answer was that uh, pharmaceutical companies have been reluctant to spend money on vaccinations for Epstein-Barr virus because it's not that clear, uh, you know, what its relationship to any diseases are. And so now that we've shown that there is more of a definite relationship, would drug companies be more likely to form uh, uh, vaccines? And, and so on the question of will there be a cure, you know, what if we vaccinated uh, everybody in childhood uh, against Epstein-Barr virus and stopped it? Would that be a cure for MS? Maybe. Now, think about that. How many people would be willing to be vaccinated? Look at what we've just been through with, with COVID and uh, uh, remarkable resistance of people to getting uh, vaccinations. Uh, there may be other uh, things too that could bring about a cure and uh, certainly research into MS is, uh, uh, is aimed at that of uh, you know, finding a cure for MS then hopefully there will be uh, an eventual cure for multiple sclerosis. Uh, looking back here, uh, uh, 
I don't see any other questions. Uh, and that seems to be all the questions that we have today, um, which brings us to the end of our time. If you missed any part of this conference, it has been recorded and will be available through the MS Focus Facebook and YouTube channels. Reply to your registration email for information on how to access recordings or sign up for our newsletter to learn about upcoming events. Be with us at 3 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday, April 27th for a MS Community Chat with host Sherry Bins. Our sincere thanks to all of our attendees for your participation, and especially to Dr. Schaefer. Thank you so much for the time you spent to prepare and share this information with us. Certainly, it's my pleasure, and thank you very much for arranging this. And uh, to all of you who attended, I hope this was helpful.